devil ain't, the devil ain't, the devil ain't welcome in here. I'll just use this one. I'm going to keep trying to turn this one on, though, because that ticks me off. Y'all don't know the panic that set in on me the night we had the cantata. It was my responsibility to change the microphone batteries. So I came up here like 15 minutes before the thing started. And you can't see them. Some of you can, but there's chargers that plug in like in a wall outlet, and they got rechargeable batteries in them. Well, I came up here and got these three microphones right here all take AA batteries. And I took all those microphones in the back. Oh, look there. See, when you say the devil ain't welcome here, things just begin to happen. That's probably something you'd hear at one of these newfangled churches that don't believe in the real Jesus. Anyway, I took all three of these microphones over to the side and had every chargeable battery had in this house, brand new charged. I put them in the microphones and none of them would come on. 15 minutes to cantata time, I was sweating like crazy. And then, you can't see it, but you have to pull this thing out of the bottom of this microphone. That's how you change the batteries. If you don't put the right one back in the right microphone, it won't come on whether you got good batteries in it or not. I'm sure I got bum fuzzled over there, and I don't know if I got the right ones in. I mean, for I think I got them to come on at two minutes till uh, the time for the cantata, and I finally went back there to where I was supposed to be standing, and the first thing I said is, anybody got some chewing gum? I'm so nervous I can't even spit. Because when I get nervous, my mouth, like right now, my mouth dry. When I get nervous, I get the dry mouth. So, man, that was a, a tense time. You think, just over batteries. Ain't that silly? Just over batteries. But anyway, thank you, Lord, that the microphone came on. Y'all get to hear my horrible voice this morning. It's going to be a blessing to you. <laughs> thank you for being here. We're grateful to have you. Grateful to have you and your family here for worship this morning. Uh, we will pray together. Let me mention a couple of things so I do not forget later on. Uh, the mission trip for the summer, July 2nd through the 7th. The sign-up sheet for that is as you go up the stairs on the static information board, Daniel has the sign-up sheet up there. Uh, he's going to give you cost and details, all that kind of stuff. He'll make all that information available to you soon. But if you know you for sure you want to go on that trip, you can go ahead and sign up. The first of the fundraisers for that trip will be May 21st. It's going to be a barbecue luncheon. It'll be here on the property. So when we say amen on May 21st on Sunday morning, we'll just go straight from here downstairs and have a time of fellowship and enjoy a barbecue dinner together that day. Uh, so that'll be the first fundraiser. There's a sign-up sheet for that in the foyer if you can come. We want you to just put your name and how many folks will be there. That gives us an idea of how many people to cook for. So May 21st will be the first fundraiser. And then this Saturday morning, May the, I thought that was rain. May the 6th, 10 o'clock till 12 o'clock noon is going to be a concert of prayer, a ladies' lakeway prayer gathering. It's at Harold Park in Marstown. If you don't know how to get there, we can give you directions for it. Uh, it says it's going to be from 10 to, till noon, but the gates are going to be opened at 9.30 in the morning. So if you want to, if you want to uh, have information about that, you can talk to Angie when she gets back, or you can talk to Miss Teresa Pedigo here this morning. She's here uh, this morning. Well, we won't have another Sunday morning before this thing happens. So if you need information about it, just ask Miss Teresa Pedigo this morning, and she could talk to you about it. Saturday morning from 10 to 12 noon at Harold Park, a ladies' Lakeway prayer gathering. All right, so I wanted to mention those things to you before. I know I forget them. Just like every Sunday, I feel like I'm forgetting something. I'm not going to forget that today. So, Praise the Lord for that. All right, we're going to have a word of prayer. If you'll stand, we'll pray together. We are receiving our offering this morning like old school way. We're passing the plates. It's coming right in front of you. Ushers will come here in just a minute. Not now, but before we have our special singing, we'll be taking our offering just like we do. Kind of get you back used to that. But we're going to do it differently where... Uh, instead of taking the money out for the counting committee to have to count it during the church, we're just bringing it right back up. You all come on. Bringing it right back up here to the front, and nobody has to miss church to count money. All right? So uh, let's pray together. And Father, thank you for the day you've given us. We're grateful to you, Lord, for every blessing that you've bestowed upon us. 
Thank you, Lord, for bringing us back to this place. We're grateful to see this number of folks in your church house this morning. We pray that I, our hearts will be opened to the are open to the movement and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. We're grateful to you that you've called us to worship this morning. May our hearts and our minds be in one accord and may our focus be worship. I pray, Father, that you would help us the best of our ability to limit hindrances and to limit distractions that might come and try to take the place of your word and try to take the place of worship this morning. Lord, we've gathered for that purpose, so uh, we pray that you would undergird us by the power of your Holy Spirit and undo us with power from the Spirit on high to just worship this morning, Father. That's why we've come. Bless us, Lord God, and direct us that we may be pleasing unto you. Certainly, if there's a person here that doesn't know Christ as Savior, let today be the day of their salvation. Whether it be a man or a woman or a boy or a girl, we believe that the gospel is so simple that children can understand and know that they're, they're lost and need a Savior too. So thank you for that. And Lord, I know, we know that as they come this morning, if anybody comes to be saved, we know that you're a God who longs to save folks. So we're grateful to you for that. God, and direct us. Let us be pleasing unto you. We give you praise and honor and glory, Lord, for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
officers, if you'll come at this time, please. Sorry. Brother Mike, would you ask the blessing on the offering, please?
slipping anything. John. I said John 21. It's John 13. I've been reading in John 21, but I'm preaching out of John chapter 13. Very familiar passages of Scripture. Now, whether you want to say uh, the washing of feet is an ordinance for the church or not, I don't have any problems with that. You're talking to a man who grew up in the Free Will Baptist Church. We did foot washings there, praise the Lord. Did a foot washing here one time, did a foot washing in Haiti, so I'm, I'm not afraid to touch your feet. That's not the lesson, though, that the Lord leaves with us because of this, or in this text, I should say. I think it's interesting how John writes, and you know we think of Luke because he's a good doctor. He's the good doctor, Luke, and he gives us a lot of details sometimes that other gospel writers don't give. But I think in this instance, John, well, in my mind, he speaks to the mind of Christ in this text as we look at it together. Now, the setting is this. The disciples are going to have the Last Supper with the Lord. But here's what they're doing. Luke says that they're arguing over who's going to be the greatest. So as they come to the place of what I would say worship with Jesus as far as the Seder meal goes, the Passover meal, they're distracted by something that should never be a hindrance or a distraction. Uh, if you all could stand up here with us on the praise team, you'd see that every Sunday morning. People are distracted by things that should never be a distraction in the church house. Yet, here we are. The reason you and I can't find ourselves in a place of worship is because we allow those hindrances and distractions to continue and continue and continue. There are things in here every Sunday morning that happen, just normal, old, ordinary, run-of-the-mill, course-of-the-day events that happen during our worship service. And we're experts at taking those and turning them into a distraction. And the, place, the reason we can't find ourselves in a place of worship is because we're more focused on the distractions around us than we are on what should be going on in our hearts and our lives. That's the way I see the disciples here at the place of the Lord's Supper. Well, it's, you and I have the Lord's Supper because of the events that take place in this particular section of the Scripture. But I think it's interesting that John kind of puts us in the mind of Jesus. And we'll talk about that. I want to read 13, 1 through 17, take our message this morning through the first 11 verses, and then this evening we'll continue in verse 12 all the way through 17. You do that in hopes people will come back at the evening service, but sometimes it works and sometimes it don't. If you can see the crowd in the parking lot on Sunday night, you'll see that most of the time it don't work. Here's the Bible says this. Is it okay that I just stand up here and tell you all the truth this morning? John chapter 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew, hear that, when Jesus knew that his hour had come that he should depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended. Now my Bible says supper being ended, but it has a footnote to go into the middle. That, and the footnote says during supper, right? Because that's when the foot washing takes place. And supper being ended, pardon me, the devil having already put it into the heart of Ju Judas's chariot. Simon's son to betray him. Now listen to this, Jesus. When John says knowing, he's getting us, giving us an insight into the mind of Jesus. He says, Jesus knowing. Now I don't consider that distracted. I think Jesus focused on some things. Jesus knowing two things, that the Father had given all things into his hands. And listen to this, and that he had come from God and was going to God. He says, he rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel with which he was girded. And here is our old good buddy, Simon Peter. He's always got something to say, doesn't he? Then, I, then he came to Simon Peter, and, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, cleanse you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. He's he goes from one extreme to the other. He said, No, you can't do this. Well, if you're going to do it, let's do it all. All right, that's Peter. That's how we know him. 
Jesus said, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him, therefore he said, You are not all clean. And we'll stop this morning, but I want to continue to reading this text so we unfold this tonight. So when he had his so when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Other places in the text, gospel writers, not just the gospel, the gospel and epistle writers, they indicate to us what? Don't just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Father, we're grateful to you for the day you've given us. Thank you for the truth of the word. Thank you for the beauty of the well, for the leadership of the Holy Spirit in John's writing, God, that you would inspire him of the Spirit to write what we have just read this morning. That, that through his, his writing, but at the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we get to have a little glimpse into the mind of Jesus, uh, really hours before he goes to the cross for the crucifixion, as he has this last, and I believe, appointed time, appointed time with his disciples. Help our hearts to be open, Lord, this morning to the reading and the understanding of your word. So grateful to you, Lord, for having this opportunity of worship and have this opportunity to preach and share the word of God together. God and direct us now. If there is a person that doesn't know you in the free pardon of sin, a person sitting here this morning who knows they're lost, knows they need a Savior, and has never trusted Christ to be that Savior, whether it's, as we said earlier, a man, a woman, a boy, or a girl, let them come to you, Lord. Let the name of Jesus be lifted up that people can run to you for salvation. And wh whatever you do in this place today, we'll give you praise and honor and glory for it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the text says, uh, it's interesting to me <clears throat> the way John tells this story because if you go through the Gospels and you see all these miracles that Jesus does, all this stuff that Jesus does, like heal people, raise people from the dead even, heal all kinds of manner of disease and sickness. He <clears throat> cast out demons. Y'all, my voice is going to go. All this kind of stuff that Jesus does, it does what? It points to the fact that Jesus is God. Right? He does all this stuff. But then you come to the place where John says, the very Jesus that's done all this healing stuff and the very Jesus who is God takes a knee in front of the, the disciples to wash their feet. And then in, in John saying out, what's he doing? He's telling us what kind of God Jesus is going to be. I think that's incredible. If you think, let that just sink in a minute. I think y'all missed your coffee shot this morning. Uh, it's kind of heavy in here. I'm going to do my best to get you out of that if I can. Now, that ain't up to me, though. That's up to the Lord. We all know that. But I think it's awesome how we see things in Jesus' life that point to the fact that He is God. Yet when we come to this event, and He takes a knee before His disciples, and He puts their old nasty, dirty feet in His hands, He washes their feet, we see just what kind of God you and I have. Amen, preacher. Preach on. Preach on. Preach on. Now, before the feast, we know that the Passover is one of the three main feasts of the Jews. Everybody comes to Jerusalem for the Passover. When Jesus knew that his hour had come, look, let me just tell you something. We don't need that page. We don't need that page. Let's just start right here. The Passover. Animal. Annual. An, animal. It's an annual feast, not an animal feast. It's an annual feast of the Jews. And Jesus, the text indicates to us that Jesus knows in this very hour that it's time for him. It's about his time. Knowing that his hour had come that he should do what? He should depart from this world and go to the Father. Well, I think about John chapter 1. I probably got it in my Bible just like you have it in yours. I didn't give you this, Darren, but it's okay. It's free. These people got Bibles. They can turn to it if they want John chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. That's where he's going back to. 
John chapter 1 verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have the God of all creation in the flesh, in the form of Jesus Christ. And yet in this moment, John says in chapter 13 verse 1, he's getting ready to go back where he came from. Now the reason I point that out to you is because when Jesus comes in the flesh, what? He has to break a fellowship that's never been broken. Now listen, I get it. He and God are still one. Don't get me wrong. They're still one. But He's no longer in heaven in the glories of God. He's down here on earth living among sinful people and living in the flesh as a man. <coughs> and I think it had to be... I don't know. I always go back to the fact that here God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit this triune God that we serve have been in fellowship since the beginning. You say, well, if you're so smart, when was the beginning? I don't have a clue. I do believe this, though. I believe that God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are the uncaused first cause. That, what's that mean? What's that mean? That means that they always have been. Before anything was, God is. And Jesus was in that, beginning with him, had to step out of that to come to live in the flesh. You know his whole purpose in coming? Salvation. His whole purpose in coming was to be the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 so that he could die for us and we could be saved. And now he's got it on his mind. He's, you ever been on vacation and be excited to get back home? Not my wife. She wants to stay at the beach. So ain't that true, Poppy? Not Deborah. She wants to stay at the beach. Not Larissa. She wants to stay at the beach. Friend, give me the mountains of East Tennessee. Now, I'll go, I'll go down there because I love them, but I don't want to stay. I want to get back home. Jesus had a longing to be back home. John is going to point us that in his mind. He said, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And what the Bible is saying is John is saying to us, See, in the past, Jesus has said to his disciples, what? My hour has not yet come. My hour is future. What's John saying that Jesus is thinking now? My hour is no longer future. It's my hour. It's time for me. It's my time. Now, check this out. To the end doesn't mean a time frame. It means that he, the, the word T-E-L-O-S means perfection or completion or completeness. So what's that mean? He loved those disciples so completely and in such a perfect manner that even when he dies and he's separated from them physically, his love will never be separated from them. What's that book? Is it the book of Romans that says, what can separate us from the love of God? And it lists seven things there, and it goes from something minimal all the way to death. It says that, that death can't even separate us from the love of God. And that's what's on Jesus' mind when it comes to him. And he's saying, it is my hour that, that even, uh, I, I can't imagine the, the wonderful times of fellowship that Jesus had had with the disciples. And now it's time for that to be over. And Jesus is saying, not even my departure can separate them from us. Just he says, I and the Father are one and you and I are one because I and the Father are one. And by the way, I'm going to send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. And we're going to continue to be one because the Holy Spirit's going to come and reside in you. But then he says this, after supper ended. Now again, my Bible has a footnote that says go over here to the center column and you'll see that, that some manuscript. It's, what, this is my Bible. I love this Bible for this reason. It's pointing out to me that there's a manuscript variation here. That some manuscripts say during supper or some say after supper had ended. My, now, I'll just tell you, I told Daniel this week, I said, I wish I could get in front of the church this week and say with surety that Jesus did this act of foot washing after the supper. Now, it wouldn't make any sense for him to do that because, okay, I ain't, I'm not going to do it, but when you're eating the Passover, you're not sitting like this, right? You are reclining pretty much like laid out on your side with your, on your elbow here, and your feet are right in the face of the dude sitting beside you. So very important that feet be washed for a meal like this. But it says, after supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So we have a contrast there between the light of Jesus Christ and the darkness of Satan or the darkness of the man whom Satan is using. His name's Judas Iscariot. 
So we see, and here's something else too. I think it was one of the theologians that I was reading after this week said that if you go back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, it says, well, let me make sure I got the right scripture in my mind. Has somebody got Matthew 5, 44 really quick? Matthew 5, 44. Uh, but I say to you, yeah, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. That ain't my word, friend. It's, it's, in, it's in red in my Bible. Meaning what? It's what? Jesus said it. I say to you, love your enemies. Jesus had an enemy sitting at the supper table. Love your enemies. That ain't easy, God. Do we have to? Yes. Bless those who curse you. Lord, are you sure you didn't mean curse those who curse you? Cuss them out. Just give them a good one. No, that's not what I meant. I meant bless them. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That's not easy, is it? Especially in our day and time when, when you're living in a culture that's so against Jesus and so many of the things that church people stand for and so many of the things that the Bible says we should stand for, the world says, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. The world don't stand for it. And then when you and I take a stand for it, what do we get? Hatred. Is it okay? Because Jesus said, uh, when you stand for these things, the world's going to hate you. But that's okay. He said, number one, the world hated me before it hated you, and that's why they're going to hate you because you love me. And secondly, he said, take courage because I have overcome the world. That's free. That ain't even part of the sermon. So here's this Judas guy, and he's sitting at the table, but really he's Jesus' enemy. And then John gives us a glimpse, an insight into the thoughts of Jesus. Jesus knowing, and I'm going to use the word thinking about, the Father had given all things in His hand and that He had come from God and was going to God. No longer would that fellowship be broken. That fellowship would be unbroken. Let the circle be unbroken. One of these days we're going to have a singing service in here. Just like you and I are going to pick up the hymn and just sing. I went to one last Sunday afternoon at, at Talbot Baptist Church at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. They had a, a hymn sing. You know what we did? Picked up the hymn book and just sang hymns out of the hymn book. It was nice. It was, I like the old hymns. So one of these days we're going to have that here. Jesus is thinking about this. My Father has given all things into my hand. Of all things that Jesus had been given, what do you think is the most important? Well, the most important thing that Jesus had been given was represented by those 12 disciples sitting around that table. You know what it is? Sinful people. And I'm saying from our perspective, some theologian could probably say, no, listen, dude, that's not right. There's something more important that God has given. But listen, in my perspective as a sinner, the most important thing that God ever gave Jesus was sinful people. That He could bring sinful people to the place of salvation and say, hey, listen, no, no longer, if you believe in Jesus, He would say, no longer are you a sinner. He said, not only have I redeemed you, not only have I, I purchased you and given you this salvation, I, I've closed, clothed you with my own righteousness. <laughs> if you're redeemed this morning, you're sitting here, and, and I see your clothes, I get that. It don't matter what you're wearing. What you're really wearing is the robe of righteousness of Jesus Christ. And it ain't yours, it's His. But He's given it to us through our faith and our Belief in Him. And Jesus got this on His mind. Here, here's the, a representation of the most important thing that God has given me. And it won't be long till the fellowship will be unbroken. No more will the fellowship be broken between the Father and the Son <clears throat> and the Holy Spirit. Now, the text says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things in His hand and what He had come from God, that He had come from God and that He was going to God, says, rose from supper and laid aside His garments, took a towel and girded Himself. So again, your Bible might say during supper or after supper. It makes the most sense that, here's, here's the way I see this. The disciples are sitting around in the upper room with Jesus about to have the Passover meal. And what are they doing? arguing over who's going to be the greatest. So basically, here's what's going on. I'm going to say, there's no way I'm going to wash Doc's feet. I'm going to be greater than him in the kingdom. 
There's no way I'm going to wash David's feet. I'm not washing Jeremiah's feet. I'm going to be greater than them in the kingdom. Let them serve me. And these guys are sitting around arguing over who's going to do this because the custom is the feet be washed. Always. And the custom is never, whether you're talking about Jewish culture or Roman culture, for the king to be washing the feet of the servants, friend. Never do you see that. And as these disciples, I, I don't know for sure that they weren't sitting around verbally arguing about who's going to be the greatest. I think they were. Let's just say that. The disciples are sitting around arguing at the supper table, arguing over who's going to be the greatest. And Jesus gets up and does what? He takes the position of a servant, takes his coat off and girds his waist with a towel. The Bible says he takes that and he pours water in a basin. And he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel which he had girded himself. Here these dudes are laying in this reclined position, so they have to kind of sit up, and Jesus is going to get to their feet, wash their feet one by one. Here's what Matthew, not Matthew Henry, John MacArthur says this, the rebuked, embarrassed, and chastened disciples watched in awkward, painful silence as the Lord, clad as a slave, knelt before each of them in turn and washed their soiled feet. Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. Then the Bible says, then he came to Simon Peter. So I don't know how many feet he had washed already, but as he comes to Simon Peter, we don't know what the number is. Simon Peter says, here's what the text says. He came to Simon Peter and he said, are you going to wash my feet, Lord? You the Lord, you the master, me the servant, and you think you're going to wash my feet? Never in Jewish culture, never in Roman culture even. Do you see something like this happen? And Peter, we know him. Uh, if you've read John MacArthur's 12 Ordinary Men book, you'll know that in that book, John MacArthur refers to Peter as the disciple with the foot-shaped mouth. Yeah, that's it. Laugh it up. Yuck it up, you Christians, because we're just like him. We, just, we got more of the characteristics of Peter in us than we'd all like to admit. And he says, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said, what I am doing now, you do not understand, but you will know after. Now listen, I don't think Jesus means that immediately after I wash your feet, Peter, you're going to know what's going on. Here's what Jesus had said in Matthew chapter 20, verse 27 and 28, he said, Whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And we understand by the writings of Peter in the New Testament, we do understand that Peter came to understand what Jesus was talking about. If you need scripture references, here you go. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 18 and 19. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. If you read those sections of the, of the text, pardon me, you will see that Peter did indeed come to an understanding of what Jesus was talking about. You can read those Bible verses and see for yourself. Then the next verse Peter said, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. I think Peter in that moment is saying something like, well, Lord, maybe I will, you know, come to this understanding. One of these days, maybe I'll come to this understanding, but whether I do or whether I don't, you ain't ever going to wash my feet. That's what Peter's saying to Jesus. And I, I, I can kind of see why, why he would say that, right? It's Jesus. He's the master and you're the servant, but what's our main responsibility towards Jesus? It's obedience. And if he comes along to wash my feet or to wash your feet, if we're Peter, we just have to let him do it because we're doing that in obedience to what Jesus wants to do. And Jesus says, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And what's he saying to Peter in that? Well, number one, he's identifying himself or identifying the... the, the 
the true nature of his mission and his first coming. Is Jesus a conquering king? Yes, he will be in the future. But in his incarnation, in his birth, like when you and I celebrate Christmas, we're not celebrating a conquering king, are we? Isaiah 53 says we're celebrating a suffering servant. Jesus didn't come in the first incarnation. His first coming was not as a, as a conquering king. His first coming is as a suffering servant. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. And in these words that he says to Peter, he's identifying to Peter his true mission. And then he says, only those who are washed are cleansed. Only those who are cleansed have a, have a part with me or have a relationship with me. The Bible uses over and over the idea of cleansing as salvation. Right? If, you're not, if Jesus hasn't cleansed you, you're not saved. If Jesus hasn't washed you or cleansed you spiritually, you're still dead in your sin. You're still lost in your sin. And if you died lost in sin and dead without Jesus apart from Christ, then the Bible says that you'll spend eternity in hell. I keep hearing these preachers on the Internet say, nobody ever preaches about hell anymore. We'll say, well, come to First Baptist Church. We preach about hell up there. Why wouldn't you? All these preachers said Jesus said three times more stuff about hell than he did about heaven. Wonderful. Hell's a real place. We need to preach about it. People need to be aware that hell is a real place. Maybe if we thought hell was a real place, we wouldn't be so distracted when we worship. We take advantage of every opportunity that we have to worship Jesus. But this is why Jesus says what he says next. Peter said, Lord, you're never going to wash my feet. He said, what I'm doing you don't understand, but you will know after this. Peter said, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus says, if I don't wash you, you have no part in me. Verse 9, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Because you know Peter's not done. He's not done sticking his foot in his mouth. It's not his nature to be quiet. Sometimes it's not our nature to be quiet. And we get ourselves in trouble sometimes. As I told you, John MacArthur said, Peter's the disciple with the foot-shaped mouth. But we see Peter make this 180. Somehow Peter is going to from, okay, Lord, you, there's no way you're ever going to wash my feet. He's going from that to, well, Lord, don't just wash my feet then. Wash my hands and my head. He's saying basically wash all of them. Lord, whatever it is you got, I want all of it, he said. He went from not wanting it at all to wanting all of it. And Jesus said these words. He who is bathed, verse 10, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. He said, you're already clean, Peter. A person who's bathed. Let's say uh, you and I took a shower before we came to church this morning. But we're living in Palestine in the times of the Bible. How did we get here? We walked. And we're going to have a meal together after church. What's going to happen? Somebody's going to wash your feet. Old dusty, dirty trails of Palestine in the area where the men lived during the Bible. Wearing those Air Jesus sandals. Everywhere they walk, their feet get dirty. Foot washing is a... a, a what would you call a, a, a bedrock of their culture? And Jesus said, if you're clean, if you took a bath before you come here, Peter, you don't need another bath. All you got to do is wash your feet. But he's saying something in that sentence. Or he's saying something, I guess, we should say in that statement. What he's saying to Peter is, if I've already made you clean, I don't need to make you clean again. And you Baptists need to hear that. If Jesus has saved you, he don't need to save you again. But he does say this, that you need daily cleansing. I'm just going to ask you this question. I don't have the answer, but it's something I've been wondering for about two weeks, three weeks actually. And when I came to this text, I thought, I'd just ask him this question. You know, we go... We come to church every Sunday and we give an invitation every Sunday and the majority of the time our invitation goes unaccepted. That breaks my heart to think 
The mission of the New Testament church is to see people come to salvation in Jesus Christ. And if you take that on its face value, then that means I'm failing in my mission. What do you mean by that? Well, if we're preaching and people ain't coming to Jesus, what's going on? What's the problem? But my question to you is this. <clears throat> do you think our church would look any different if you and I as Christian people took advantage of the altar call? See, you and I come in here every Sunday, and we sure as heck don't want our neighbors to think that there's anything going on wrong in our lives or anything that we would need to reach out to Jesus for. God forbid that church people, that Christian people, reach out to Jesus for something. Okay, that's it. That's the question. I'm moving on. Physically, he was saying to Peter, Peter, if your feet get dirty from travel... All you need to do is wash your feet. Spiritually, he was saying, if Jesus really has washed you, he's cleansed you forever. You don't need him to cleanse you again. I've told you this story maybe pretty recently, I guess, but when we were doing Judgment House, now this is my opinion, my estimation. It seemed to me that the people who needed to most rededicate their lives were the people who came from religious doctrines that taught you could lose your salvation. I don't believe that whatsoever, friend. I think an eternal God saves sinful people for an eternity. I think if you've truly been saved in here, now I'll just tell you, there's times in my life that I lived like hell, but I was still saved. It didn't look like it. And my witness to a lost and dying world was certainly not the fact that I was saved. But somehow I was. Why? How? How could you be saved? Well, God saved me for an eternity. I don't know what else to tell you. God saved me for an eternity. And if you've truly been saved in here this morning, you've been saved for an eternity. You don't need your body washed again. All it is is your feet you need to wash. Well, how can I get my feet washed? Well, you could come to the altar when the invitation goes out. Listen, this ain't no attempt to get a bunch of people at the, at the altar for the invitation. I just think it, our church would be different if that was the case. You can make peace with God right where you're sitting. You don't have to come out of nothing. You don't have to walk nowhere. You can do it right where you are. It's a beautiful thing about the God we serve. The lady from uh, the, 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 uh, Brahma Kumaras World Spiritual University. When she came down here to my office to tell me about their, the deity religion, they got a trinity like we do. It's called Brahma, Shankar, and Vishnu. Except their Holy Spirit is called Vishnu the Destroyer. That ought to give you some clues. Vishnu the Destroyer. When she come and talk to me about that, and she said, all the things she said, I said, ma'am, I said, even if I was an idiot and didn't know a thing about Jesus, I said, I'd choose Christianity over your religion any day because I don't want to have to go to a certain place twice a month so I can meet with the God that I serve. She said, where can you meet with your God? I said, anywhere I want to. I said that to her. She said, you don't have to be at the church because we were in my office, and I think I brought them in here and showed them this. It was the old sanctuary, the old, all the green in here. She said, you don't have to go in there? And I said, no, ma'am. I said, you could be, I want to say you could be driving down the road listening to the Gaithers and just get happy with the Lord. But you all know what I'm talking about. You don't have to go some specific place. You don't have to come out. I'm just saying, I believe that would change the face of the church. And Jesus is saying to the disciples, Peter, you don't need to be washed again. You're already washed. And if you are already washed, you don't have to be washed again. But you need, and see, that's the difference between salvation and sanctification. It's mine and your responsibility to call on the Lord daily for what? Forgiveness. Well, I didn't do anything. Well, yeah, you did. Even if you don't think you did or you didn't know you did, you did. Sometimes it's commission. Sometimes it's omission. What's that mean? That means sometimes we do things that we know we shouldn't do, and sometimes we do things that we didn't know we did. We left them out. There are things that you and I should do as believers daily that we don't do. And the Bible says if a man knows what to do and he doesn't do it, then that's a sin. And you and I need to be cleansed from that sin. 
The reason our church and our families and the world don't look any different than they do, because we just trodden along. Our feet are all dirty because of sin, because we're not getting before the Lord to say, Lord, I need your cleansing. I need you. I think if you, if you, I think it'd be just fine if tonight you just pray and you say, Lord, I need you to wash my feet. I think God will accept that if you're saved now, because here's what he said. He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. And see, that's the heart of the message today. Not all of you. Not everybody that comes to church is saved. I, I would hope the great majority of people are, but if a person who is as... Now, I'll use this term. If a person who is as godly and holy, meaning set apart as Billy Graham is, and he stands up in his meetings and says 50% of the people that come to church ain't saved, that makes me worry. I mean, as a minister, that makes me worry to think that if he's right, that means if you're preaching to 100 people, 50 of them's going to go to hell. What? And the daughter in church, God. I mean, what else would they be doing here, God, if they weren't saved? Why would they be here? And you just start listing things. When you get right down to the root of it, right down to the bottom of the problem is, it's just what Jesus said. They simply aren't clean. Just not clean. Never been washed. Never been cleansed. Oh yeah, they come to church a lot and give money sometimes and help do things even in the church, but they never been saved. They said, you're clean, but not all of you. John MacArthur in his commentary says, he uses this phrase. He said, at that table there was sitting one notable, he calls him a notable exception. That's what John MacArthur says of Judas. He said, there's a notable exception sitting at that table with Jesus. And man, I, I would submit to you that Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, we have notable exceptions who come right through the doors of the church, hear the preaching of the Word, and leave God's house as a notable exception. Continuing in the path of sin, continuing in the ways of sin, even though they've heard... The, now listen, I'm not just talking about our church. I'm talking about all churches. Well, all churches that preach the truth of the gospel. Because I'm going to tell you, friend, you don't have to... Here's, here's my bad habit. Oh, I left my phone in there. My bad habit is I see something on Instagram and I like, and what am I doing for the next two hours? Flipping down to the next video, next video, next video, next video. You don't have to flip very far through that to see that you and I are living in a day where we got wolves in sheep's clothing who have humongous crowds of people. They have the, uh, the uh, technology and the availability to use technology to reach an even greater crowd than the stadiums full of preacher, people that they're preaching to. Now listen, not all of, not all mega churches are this way, but what I see in a great majority is a lot of these preachers are not preaching the truth of the gospel. And that's no surprise to us, right? Because we're living in the end times, and the Bible says that perilous times will come, and people will gather to themselves people with itching ears. That breaks my heart to think that a man could have such a following that he has a football-sized stadium church of people sitting there to listen to him preach the truth, and he don't even tell them the truth. That's happening every Sunday in the country that you and I live in. People are gathering in, like, seriously, arena-sized churches. Thousands of people gathering to hear preaching, and what they're getting is not the truth. That blows my mind. In a crowd this big, if Billy Graham's right, there are some notable exceptions sitting in this place this morning. And here's the thing. You know who you are. A man or a woman or a boy or a girl that's been saved by the mighty saving power of Jesus Christ, they know that. Is there a possibility that that person's walking in sin? Absolutely. 
We used to call that any old Free Will Baptist Church backslid. Is it possible that Christian people have backslid and they've walked away from the Lord? Yeah. You know why one of the reasons they do that? Because we don't... I'll shut up about that in a minute. But it's because we don't come up here. We certainly don't want our name. Oh, Lord, we can't let the church people know that our lives ain't perfect. Gosh, what would they think about us? What would a lost and dying world think if Christian people really... Got, did y'all hear some of the words we sang in these songs this morning? That ain't easy, friend. There is a place of quiet rest. Where is that place, preacher? Near to the heart of God. Huh? You stay off this altar long enough and you won't get nowhere near that place. Now listen, I'm saying that figuratively because you could be doing that at home. could be doing that in your car. You might have some prayer closet at your house that nobody knows about that you were serious when the Lord said get in your prayer closet. You might have that at home. You don't need this. But I guarantee you some of you do. Now let me say this. I guarantee you some of us do. Are you the notable exception this morning? If you strip away all those layers and that big smile of yours and your church clothes and the people around you could see you for the truth of who you are, would you have to stand up and say, it's me, God, I'm the notable exception? Because I'm going to tell you what, friend, you can fool me, you can fool the praise team, you can fool your Sunday school teachers, you can fool the deacons of the church, you can fool these ushers who come and took your money, but you cannot fool God. Period. And here's the thing, when I say that, I don't mean you could just fool me for one Sunday. I mean you could fool me for the remainder of my life or yours. You could come to this church every week and put on a smile and put your money in the plate and everybody around you think everything is just fine. And you're sitting there knowing the truth of the matter is everything is not just fine. But here's the truth. There are people sitting in this congregation today who are walking with God. God. And, and the things I'm saying right now, they're not for you, they're not to you. Because you are in fellowship with God as He deems it to be. And there are people in this place today who are saved. No, there's no doubt about it that you're saved. But here's what you're doing. You're so backslid, you ain't got a clue how to get a hold of God in this moment. He ain't left you. You're still saved. But because of the things you're doing and the way you're walking, ain't no way you could get convicted of Christianity in any court in this land. And God, He's been, it ain't just this morning, He's been beckoning you, come back. Please come home, be the prodigal. Come on, come home. And you say, well, what do I got to do? It's this simple, Lord. And that's it. You say a prayer. And you say, God, forgive me. I've walked away from you and I want to come back into fellowship with you. And I'm telling you, in that moment, how does God do it, preacher? I ain't got a clue. The question I'd like to ask is why? Why does He do it? Why does God love us with an unconditional love that we'll never understand because you and I don't love each other with that same kind of love? And then the third group of people, I always used to say there's two groups of people, but there's really three. There's the saved walking with Jesus. There's the saved living backslidden and the notable exceptions. And I'm going to tell you this, friend. If you are the notable exception, you better get your life right before Jesus Christ, before it is eternally too late. And you say, don't say it like that, preacher. That's the way the old preachers used to say it. You're trying to scare people into getting saved. There ain't a thing you could say to a sinner to scare them into getting saved. And I don't know how you feel about this, but here's the way I think. Sinners hate God. They may not proclaim that or say, I hate God. Y'all know who uh, R.C. Sproul is? And if I'm quoting the wrong man, forgive me. But one of these theologians said, you could go right now to the gates of hell. Jesus could go right now to the gates of hell and open the gates of hell and say, y'all come on. And nobody would go because they hate Jesus. That's why they're in hell. They don't believe. They hate. That's... Is that, are you the notable exception? Are you going to go to hell because you don't want your neighbor to... You want to... Are you going to go to hell because you want your neighbor to think you're perfect? Are you? 
Are you the notable exception in here this morning? Are, are, you the, are you the saved person who's living like hell? And you know it and nobody else does except you and the God that saved you. You're just going to keep on that. I'm just trust my salvation. Just trusting in my salvation, preacher. Won't you trust in the God that saved you to bring you cleanliness? Won't you trust in the God that saved you to bring you some sanctification? And then to those of you who are walking a path, you think, dude, you've lost your mind this morning. I can't believe you get up on the church pew and say these things. It's serious. We're talking about an eternal matter. Eternal matter for who? Every... I don't know why I do this, y'all. I'll be driving down the road like... All these cars going around me and them. I, every, I, I'm thinking every person that's driving these cars has a soul. And every soul is going to stand before the Lord. And they're either going to be saved or lost. And according to the truth of the Bible, the great majority of people are going to hell. I would hate to think that would be people who have come to church. And listen, I'm not trying to brag on my preaching, but I am saying to you, I promise, to the best of my ability, I'm giving it to you, the truth of the gospel. There's no way I would try to make a following for myself when I could preach the gospel of Jesus. And the truth of that Bible is the great majority of people are going to live their lives, finish their lives, and end up in hell. Now that's for eternity. Our lifetime, I mean, what's the average age of a person now? Like 78, 80 years old, something like that? Think about 80 years compared to eternity. That's why the Bible says our life is but a vapor. It's like a candle that was glowing and you went, whew, gone. And listen, here's the truth. You and I, this Sunday, are would you say seven or eight days, seven days closer to Jesus Christ coming than we were when we sat here and heard this preacher puke last Sunday. Seven days closer to eternity. Is your life any different today than it was last Sunday morning? Are you still allowing the hindrances and distractions that are present in the church to keep you from the place of worship? Are you still walking in sin because nobody knows it and you're afraid to get on the altar because you don't want your neighbors to, you don't want to tarnish your perfect image with them? We all come to the music, we're going to have a time. What's the song we're singing? As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after you. That's what the psalmist said. He said that Jesus was as important to him as drinking water. Is that you this morning? As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. Does it? Lord, here today, have your way in our time of invitation. May our hearts be open to you, to your leadership, and to your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just stand right where you are and sing to the Lord this morning. Sign up for the youth uh, mission trip. That's July 2nd through July 7th. The sign-up sheet is up the hallway near Daniel's room up there on the static board. 
uh, sign-up sheet in the foyer for the first uh, <clears throat> fundraising meal for that. That'll be a barbecue dinner here on the 21st. When we finish our service here, we'll just move downstairs into the fellowship hall and have a barbecue dinner there on, on our grounds to raise money uh, to help support Daniel and the youth in that, in that mission trip. And then on Saturday, ladies, if you're interested in that ladies' concert of prayer, it'll be at Harold Park from 10 until noon. Gates are opening at 9.30. If you have questions, you can see Miss Teresa. Uh, she's here this morning. Might be able to answer questions that you might have uh, regarding that. Other announcements? Okay, a ladies' brunch. And then ladies, the, uh, what was her name? Caitlin Daniel. A lady called me from Isaiah House this week. When Mindy and I went down there for the open house, we were looking, you know, they have a huge supply room in the basement, and they give the children bags of stuff before they leave. She asked, how, I told them we wanted to support that. And she said, how did we want to do it? So that's something we need to talk about. She said she would love to get a church that would just supply shoes. So that's just something I want to send that out to you before I forget about it. But that's something we need to talk about. How do we want to continue to support the Isaiah House down there as far as uh, helping them replenish the materials that they give out when the children leave their, their uh, facility. Uh, other announcements? Sign up for how many you're going to bring. What was your question, Jay? I'm sorry, I cut you off. No, it's going to be provided... You just need to sign. We just need to know how many folks to cook for. The food's going to be provided. Oh, that's the cake auction too. So if you're going to make a dessert or a cake or some, you know, sometimes people, I know in the past people have provided entire meals for that. So if you're going to do that, you can sign up and then we'll do the cake auction that morning too. Any other announcements? Uh, chimes, five, five o'clock this evening for those who are chimes, and then uh, six o'clock for Bible study. We'll finish this text, and then uh, I thought I was about to say something, but maybe not. Anyway, oh yeah, prayer request. Go, go ahead, Donnie. Building grounds are meeting right after we say amen in the conference room just for a short meeting. And then put your prayer requests in the box and we'll get those to you by the one call. Anything else? Uh, did anybody have a twin bed that they could give uh, to these children in this family that we've helped? Jason says he's got one. Miss Tina? Okay, Jason's got a twin, so we'll take that. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for the day you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for all your blessings, for bringing us to this place today, allowing us to have this time of fellowship together. Forgive us where we failed you for the many times we've come short of your glory. We're so grateful to you, Lord, for unconditional love, and that is the way you love us, and we don't deserve it, and I, we're just grateful to you, Father, for your love and your mercy and your grace. We thank you for our church family. Pray your blessings on them. Be with us, Lord, as we depart this place today. We need your provision and your protection everywhere that we go and in all the things that we do. Give us a boldness to be a good witness for the gospel and the love of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. And we'll give you praise and honor and glory, Lord, for all you do through us and in us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, dude.